Ms. Rinka Banerjee, Thinking Folks, Bengaluru. <coughs> and Chef Dhruv Obroy. We have more people on the stage than <laughs> We are so fortunate that so many people have come together and have accepted our invitation and have joined hands in this mission, in this really, really important mission. And we have with us on stage our uh, CEO of Food Future Foundation, Mr. Pavan Agarwal. So we can begin with Raji. Yes. So we would like to begin with uh, Mr. Rajiv Ahels. Address. Mr. Rajiv, over to everybody. Put your hands together for Mr. Rajiv. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think a lot has been said, so I will try not to repeat it. Uh, I think in all that we've heard today in terms of the challenges, the gaps, the work that still needs to be done, the wonderful work that has been done so far, we do need to recognize that from a food a systemic perspective to food, there are these three boxes we need to look at at the same time. Uh, one is of course the whole food production part. Uh, if the way agriculture today is, is not very sustainable, it's full of pesticides, if it's really uh, misusing, overusing water, it's also contributing to greenhouse gases. And also the farmers are not getting good livelihood out of it. Most young people do not want to do agriculture. So if this is a reality, where are the possibilities and solutions? And actually, they lie within agriculture itself. The only way Earth sequesters carbon is through a plant. Let's not forget that. It's not going to be some carbon stacks made by industries which will put it down on the ground. It will be plants itself. So how do we look at the way agriculture is done? How do we change it? I'm very happy to say, a lot of the work that we've been doing at the Indo-German Development Corporation, uh, which also Mr. Martin Hoppe talked about at the beginning, is around these approaches of agroecology. So increasingly, how to make farmers grow crops using local varieties, using traditional and modern techniques with less water, in situ bioresources from their own nearby areas, what is being called as natural farming. And I'm very happy to share that the Prime Minister himself, the Agriculture Minister, almost all the key departments and ministries and many states as champions like Andhra Pradesh have shown that natural farming is possible. And even the earliest sort of examples that are coming out are showing that a diversity of crops grown even in some of the most arid areas and in, in, in irrigated areas especially have led to a reduction of water use by 40 to 50 percent. And you're getting resilient crops, you're getting local crops, you're getting at least six to seven diverse nutrient-rich foods being produced locally, which do not need to travel far in plastics or through huge fossil fuel footprints. So I think localizing agriculture becomes very important. But this agriculture will not work because nobody is demanding it. The share of organic or natural food globally and in the in, in market, if you talk to the FMCG people, is less than 1 to 2% of their portfolio. And who, who, who really asks for food? How does the industry make the food to be in that way? It makes this because that's the way the consumers demand it. So I think this entire body of work in creating consumer awareness, taking away the fears of consumers about what is natural food, having education, especially starting with the youth and youth leaders, starts becoming very important. So this is the second box of the consumption part. But the main part, I think, if we don't get this alignment right, the bridging part is how the food is processed and moved forward by various companies, startups. Uh, I think it's very important that these three <coughs> boxes in themselves have to look at sustainability. But they also have to connect. Like I said, there's a lot of work where farmers have actually started doing natural farming. They form a farm, farm producer organizations, but nobody's willing to buy that food. So they're going back, 
to the chemical intensive industrial agriculture having given up on this. So therefore the work to connect these dots becomes the most important. And so far, all these efforts have been done in isolation. There's a huge group of civil society organization, development organizations like us, who work on the, on the production side. There's a huge, not so huge group of people who work on the consumption side. And the consumption messaging is all controlled only from a very chemical, industrial perspective. Because that's the way also consuming locally within India, and only the gaps that we have should be rectified. And here, then industry plays an important role. Because the industry is the one who will have to find the ways and means to make this happen. For this to, for the farmer to have enough profit to be able to continue to do the type of sustainable agriculture that is needed. Right now, almost all of our agriculture that I talked about is happening that way because we have subsidized all the chemicals in our inputs at Northern. Is this time, at this point of time, the subsidy bill for fertilizers has run, crossed 150,000 euros. It's not possible to continue like this. So can this subsidy not be shifted closer to the farmers and how they produce, rather than spend it only on chemical form of agriculture? I think these shifts are happening. We see the government policies happening. We see many states beginning to do this. We see many companies coming forward to try and look for such solutions. But in order for all of this to come under one umbrella, different voices, different interests, how do you talk, how do you discuss, how do you create combined end-to-end -end models where we make these things work at a small scale. And then the fact that it works helps us to scale it up. A, because it's the right thing to do, gives it healthy food for the healthy world, and also good, good for the economy as well. So from that perspective, I think the coalition that is being built becomes very important. And for us as Indo-German Development Corporation, it becomes very, very important that connecting the dots, making the fragments come together into a powerful large, is very, very crucial at this point of time. And I think the galaxy of people, what you represent here, the interest that is here, and also the conversation we've been having, and I'm very happy, Pavanji, that this conversation on coalition started from a very, um, not thought through process in 2021 during the time of COVID when we started working on this UN, UN food systems summit report. And I'm very happy the conversations where I let people to realize, to connect, to engage, and to really think that it needs more than paper and talk. It actually needs human beings to come together and work together. And what we're beginning to see today, and not this is the start, is the formation of the coalition of the willing. That we come together, because we have a choice. And if we don't act together, as has been pointed out by numerous people, if there's a time, it's now. We are down to about 45 harvests in terms of global catastrophe. We don't have much time. And therefore, the need to come together to find a common purpose, despite the differences, to find the common purposes and to work together. And therefore, getting this diverse group of people together into a structured, coalition format, where there are these seven wonderful work streams, where each work stream creates its own solutions, its own partnerships, and these seven work streams, like the Sangam, come together to bring a holistic perspective on agroecology and food system. This is the design, this is the intent, this is the beginning, and I'm very happy and look forward to more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Raji sir. Moving on, friends, I would uh, like to share with you my first interaction uh, that uh, we had regarding this uh, event with Pawan sir. I meet him in his office, and he he asks me. He starts asking. Uh, he starts with a question, and he asks Pati. So imagine if uh, you are in front of a mad elephant. What will you do? <laughs> and I say, sir, I think I will try to run. I may also freeze. I don't know. So I, he said, yes. That uh, that's what most people would answer. But uh, what if it was not just about you? What if there was the 
life of a whole village that depended on you. How would you think then? And sir, in that case, then I would have to think of something like a solution. Uh, and said, yes. Then you would think like a hero would think. You will have to ask the question, how can I tame this elephant? How can I synergize the villagers here? Maybe, but you know, you will come up with something. You, will, you may think that there is a thorn in this elephant's feet and you may notice that and you may take it out and the elephant may be fine. Or maybe you will uh, run him over into, towards the forest, you know, to his, away from the village. You will think like that. You will not run away from it. So that is what we are facing in the food systems in India. And I was like, <laughs> yes, my mind was completely, no, 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 it is exactly the same. It is exactly what he said to me and that just blew my mind. He said, so this is what we are facing. We are facing a big problem, a elephant sized problem. So then we have to think of a solution. We have to think like a hero. And uh, what can be the answer to this elephant-sized problem? A solution to this elephant in the room? And the solution is a butterfly. And not just any butterfly, this uh, beautiful rainbow color, coffee butterfly that is the puzzle. That is the different pieces of the puzzle coming together in this with your color from uh, violet, indigo, blue, yellow, orange, red. And each color is signifying a different problem area, a different work area. And that was the solution that Food Future Foundation and all our supporters, we have all collaborated together and come up with Focusing on seven different areas, diets and consumption, food waste and food loss, food business, agroecology agro and smallholding farmers, policy and institutions, food system leaders and food environments. So everybody, let's put our hands together for the butterfly. So here we are ready to redefine the butterfly effect and to moderate uh, all the upcoming uh, experts' talks uh, on each of the action plans. I would like to give it over to our visionary thought leader, CEO of Food Future Foundation, Mr. Pavan Agarwal. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> you know, of course, I did say about the elephant thing, but I couldn't have said so beautifully as you narrated. You know, I think she's truly amazing. You know? <laughs> Big round of applause, and we wrote the sari. He went on the way, you know, to find the sari <laughs> with butterflies. I think amazing. Uh, uh, Swati, it uh, met her in left hand, and uh, the way she was carrying the entire audience with her, and I have to get her. You know? <laughs> so our Ali went, you know, thank you very much. You know, I'm mindful of time, you know, particularly uh, since uh, our CEO FSSCI has to leave. Uh, but uh, I don't know how to go about it. How much can you? <laughs> I know you have to leave at 4.45. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, so, so, Pista, how many, how many more minutes do you have? 20 minutes, yeah, great. No, no, so, uh, so 20 minutes, yeah, okay. So, so I think uh, we will not follow the details. We'll, we'll, are you okay? Are you going to follow the details? Okay. So, because I would like uh, a few things that we are doing. To be shared by the group uh, in presence of uh, Mr. Kamala Rao. You know, and let me begin by, I think, uh, we have heard a little bit about food literacy, etc. And, uh, you know, Dr. Subha Rao is there. We can take up that with a little later on, on the demand side. Let's go straight to food businesses, because that is what FSCCI deals with. And, uh, you know, if you could come and uh, you know, we <coughs> would have a little bit of introduction about Jinofi and, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, everyone, so 
we are going to begin uh, with food businesses, uh, the act, one of the action labs. Uh, and for this, uh, we have with us CEO Beyond Nuts and IBEN, Mr. Zunofi Anto Rosarina. Over to Ms. Zunofi. Hi everyone, so uh, I'm a behavioral scientist, so I work on understanding how people behave and also on various things related stuff. So uh, IBEN is India Behavioral Economics Network, it's a network of most or all behavioral scientists or behavioral economists, behavioral science people, everyone related to this field in India. Uh, I also run a consulting company called Beyond Nest Consulting. So yeah, that's about me. Now you see a new picture of me, the other one was me when I was young. <laughs> Okay, awesome. So yeah, let's get started. So yeah, what, what what do we mean when we say food businesses? We're talking about everyone, including street food street food vendors, small businesses, we're talking about large corporations, everybody. And we have a couple of key stakeholders here that we need to keep in mind. One, obviously the businesses themselves. Um, the customer and the consumer. So the customer is the one who's paying for it, the consumer is the one who's actually consuming the food. There's still be different as well, and it's important to acknowledge that. And lastly, the governance, which helps us tie all of this together. And um, so, yeah, there's a couple of challenges that we face in the food ecosystem. For instance, one, let's talk about the business-related uh, challenges. One is ethical sourcing of all the raw materials. Um, there isn't a great way to track the entire supply chain, for instance, the end-to-end -end tracking of the whole uh, we do a lot of small and middle sized enterprises don't have a lot of access to finance, so this also reduces the R and D they put into food and all of that as well. And again, there is a lack of food mentorship, business mentorship, specifically in the food sector. Um, okay, thanks. <laughs> so the next one is on the consumer side of things. So imagine from a consumer standpoint, it's very important that we break this perception of healthy food is not tasty food, and tasty food is often not the healthier option, right? So we need to balance this concept of taste, convenience, as well as health, and that is really important, and that's something the consumer cares about. Um, and again, consumers are often skeptical about what actually is in the product, and so this, all these certifications are helpful, but yeah. And lastly, there are a lot of certifications, and you know it, and uh, which of these are sustainable, and which of these are is the one thing that we can just look at and know that it's something you can trust. That is something that is still a challenge. Yeah. So just moving forward, we have a couple of suggestions and recommendations and ideas that we have. One, for instance, is there are a lot of marketing campaigns out there. There are lots of health drinks claiming to make people you know, stronger and all of that. How trustable is that? And how do we promote very ethical and true marketing? And secondly, a lot of resources need to be allocated into research and development, specifically what I mentioned earlier of balancing taste, um, health, and convenience, and that's super important as well. And the next thing is the whole problem of not being able to trace your food right from sourcing till the last end product. And for that, there are a lot of nice digital ways that have come up, including you know using um, the blockchain and all of that. Um, lastly, we also feel that there's a lot of importance needed in the energy sector in terms of reducing the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And um, the next question. Okay, cool. So, uh, okay, you can see it. Great. So, another really, really nice solution to this challenge that we're facing. You can see a bunch of these things highlighted in green. I really like the concept of character principle, and I realize that a lot of these issues can actually be solved by one nice thing, and that is, the next slide please, <laughs> yeah, that is Be Good Food Company certification, and for that I'll please invite, yeah, Sushila to come and uh, introduce that to you guys. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Rashida Vapiwala, and I'm the founder of Label Rank. Uh, we are a digital food label solutions company and uh, through the coalition, uh, we've had the chance to partner with Food Future Foundation to introduce the Good Food Company certification. 
uh, which is a program and initiative that will uh, look at food companies and acknowledge them for the efforts that they are making to bring more nutritious produce to market. Uh, it's an initiative that allows us to strengthen food systems by building a lot of trust and quality in the food products that are out there in the market and enable consumers to make more wholesome choices. We are looking at some very objective parameters which are based on science. Uh, so we have eight parameters that contribute uh, to making a good food company a good food company. So that, that will be starting from a nutrition, the quality of nutrition that is coming through the products, the ingredient quality. Are we choosing the right quality of ingredients? Are we using high fruits and vegetables, millets, legumes? Are we good in, uh, using uh, good quality proteins? We're looking at the purity of food products. What are the levels of pesticides? What are the levels of uh, adulterants? Clean label products, products that are made with the use of minimal additives, minimal chemicals. Sustainability measures that a company is undertaking. What kind of packaging material is the product being sold in? Labeling compliance, very important to build the transparency and share everything about the product with the customer. Accessibility, how many cities in India or outside is this product available in? and product innovation. These are nothing but the cornerstones of assessing food companies uh, and an entire criteria has been put in place which allows companies to achieve the good food company certification. While we see that uh, there are a number of certifications out there, the GFC in specific is looking at benefiting food companies, we are, uh, our inclusion criteria is largely the MSME sector, food businesses with a turnover of less than 500 crores. We are also inviting large company and their business units who fall under this criteria. So we'd be happy to invite uh, uh, a lot of food companies that uh, today do fall under this uh, criteria. And in fact, I take the opportunity in this room to uh, invite uh, you know, partnerships, getting companies to generate interest in getting this certification uh, for themselves. The, ans the answer here is that the good food company certification will be a marker of healthier products, which in turn enable a lot of consumer loyalty for food businesses, generate sales, help in the expansion to newer markets, not just within India but abroad as well. It becomes a sustainable competitive advantage and levels the playing field for MSMEs at, along with large companies out there. And this, of course, is adding to the brand repute, the equity that the company is generating for itself uh, by bringing innovative and differentiated products to the market and, of course, is uh, generating a lot of investor uh, interest these days as well. So a lot of benefits out there for food companies uh, through, in the last uh, 24 hours of uh, the, uh, the World Food India Forum, there has already been a significant amount of interest generated by food companies to participate, and uh, we'll be digitizing this entire piece along with uh, Food Future Foundation, and we believe that uh, the GFC certification will be a game changer in uh, acknowledging, thanking, and uh, uh, putting out the market about uh, for products who are bringing healthier, nutritious food products for consumers. That will be all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This, is, this, is, this is inspired by uh, a certification called BCOM certification in Europe. And uh, I think, uh, uh, Manisha, how does a company uh, just need to uh, sell this idea to 12 companies? So 12 companies this morning.
Thank you, sir. And definitely, we have to find new and creative ways. And that's what this Action Lab is all about. The next uh, topic is of food system leaders. And for this, I will be inviting from Thinking Folks Bengaluru, Ms. Rinka Banerjee, and uh, she will be later joined by Chef Guru Ogrod. Hello everyone, I'm Rinka Banerjee and I'm the founder of Thinking Folk Consulting. We are an end-to-end R&D solutions company um, and we are founded by experts um, with a collective experience of more than about 200 plus years of uh, innovation and R&D. So innovation is at the core of what I do, and I've been doing uh, for more than 30 years and therefore this is a topic which is of absolute um, interest to me and that I'm super passionate about. So, um, so what is Food Systems Innovation uh, Innovation Fellowship all about? And I will uh, come to that. But fundamentally, I know when um, Pavan sir had first reached out to me and we were talking about this, and I think we spoke a lot about how are we going to build future leaders of tomorrow if we are going to have very different problems to solve as compared to what we, some of us, grew up doing in like the last 15, 20 years. Right? So I think this is uh, extremely important. We have a thriving food innovation ecosystem how do we really capitalize on that and create high quality leaders? Yeah, just move on. So, um, like I said, it is about high quality, but the second thing that's very important is it's market ready, right? Um, today we have loads of research institutes and we've got some fantastic institutes generating great you know, students coming out of that uh, with very limited knowledge of how to take research and innovation to market, right? So I think one of the important things of this whole fellowship is about making them market ready, right? And you'll see, go back please. Yeah, and you'll see two images here, and the reason uh, I want to really put these two images, we are very imaginative, we are creative people. I mean, Gabe Bush and Ryan on up there, at you know, one third the cost and so on. So we are, we are super innovative, right? Um, at the same time, it's very important to connect the dots. And I think um, if people and planet are to dots that are supposed to be super connected, right? But if you ask me, that is getting to be very, very disconnected. And I think that's a connection that we have to be able to make. Uh, and that's one of the objectives of this fellowship as well, is create leaders, create people who can innovate, but be able to put, uh, you know, connect all the dots between a consumer to a, you know, agriculture to, uh, you know, getting the finances going and all of that stuff, yeah? So, um, why do we need this? I mean, we've got a lot of institutes, we've got internships happening and things like that. Why do we really need this kind of a fellowship? The first thing is to build, uh, to bridge the knowledge gap. And like I said, um, a lot of students coming out, some of them very high quality students, come out with good knowledge of technology, they'll come out with good knowledge of research, but do they understand what does the consumer want? How is it going to get manufactured? What is the back end of it? Do I understand the supply chain of this? Uh, you know, how am I going to produce this and stuff like that? Yeah. So I think that is one of the knowledge gaps that we want to bridge. Of course, providing market access. 
right? And we'll see why we're talking about that through the Bexham class study. So we have a lot of capacity. We want to generate high quality um, students coming out of, uh, you know, who are absolutely market ready. Yeah, just move on. So the value proposition job of food businesses is to be able to have high quality talent, which can provide disruptive growth to the businesses, right? And they are highly skilled, well trained. Because I know I've been in the industry for more than 30 years. When students come in and work with us, I have to spend a lot of time getting them to understand how does things work in real world, right? Now, if you can get them to be skilled, well trained, so that they get literally hit the road running, right, is a way we can get there. The second of, uh, you know, value proposition is for the academic institutes, and the whole idea of providing uh, opportunity to the students having a platform where they can, you know, just reach out to as many companies and so on, and really making it very, very accessible. In some ways, it's almost democratizing that process. Yeah? Um, so the way the Innovation Fellowship will run, we will be running this in, in three modules. The first module will be a comprehensive training, which will be there for six weeks. A lot of it will be virtual, maybe some uh, in person. And we are already speaking to many, many global experts who are very happy to come and train these students online, right? So set up training programs, and this will be something that will be accessible to anyone who applies. It will go through then post a written uh, test and some certain set of interviews. A selected group of our cohort will be selected, which will then move on to the next module, which is about training with companies. And this is where they will start having access to market. Uh, they will train with companies in R&D, in innovation for about between three to six months. It will depend on their curriculum as well, right? Once they do that, they will then come back to the fellowship and they will be actually working on one innovative solution project which they will need to pitch to the panel of the innovation fellowship and in that pitch, there will be uh, investors as well, yeah? So they will have a good idea of saying, tomorrow if I want to be an entrepreneur, what should I be doing in terms of being able to pitch my entire innovation uh, process and stuff like that, yeah? Um, so these are some of the academic partners who we have reached out to and who already expressed interest like CSERI, NIFSIM, um, IIT Delhi. Uh, I've reached out to some of the smaller institutes which is in the interiors of India and they produce great quality students by the way, like Geetam and uh, JNTU and stuff like that, National Dairy Research Institute and so on. Industry partners, for example, I myself have committed to having uh, you know, at least another, you know, maybe between five to ten students every year within that um, network. <coughs> Similarly, I know Country Delight, Marico, and SKA, we have reached out to them, and everybody's expressed interest in having this because they want market ready innovation kind of leaders who are very ready for solving uh, problems of tomorrow. Yeah, so that's uh, really about us, and uh, this is how it's going to be, and like I said, for students, it's about a comprehensive learning experience. Real world immersion, a collaborative networking as well. I mean, they will have a lot of experiences in terms of the kind of experts they're reaching out to and stuff like that, and really getting validated by industry. And for the industry partners, it's effortless talent access, and I won't say it's just talent access, it's sort of high quality talent. I mean, instead of them going to institutes and all of that, you have a platform where you can access uh, high quality students. Um, and then, yes, of course, a collaborative ecosystem. And eventually, one can go through a certification, uh, you know, and, and this would be sort of a certification and global acknowledgement, because tomorrow if students want to apply, for example, for masters and things like that, or an MBA, right? Having a uh, sort of a uh, certification to say that they are uh, FSI certified kind of students would be a good thing to have, yeah? So that's really about uh, the fellowship, and it's, like I said, it's about creating future leaders. And I'm hoping uh, with this, and I would really reach out to all of you um, you know, to, to support us and to see if there are uh, companies, if there are institutes that you'd like to reach out, we'd be more than happy to have uh, so speak. collaborate. So help them, why, why don't you introduce them and say something? Yes, please. Come here, <laughs> come. A young, passionate, uh, future leader. <laughs> everyone. First of all, thank you for having me here, of course. So I have graduated uh, and I have my B.Tech in Food Engineering and Technology from ICT Mumbai. I've just graduated in the month of May and in the month of June I was very fortunate to spend one month with Sir as a TIFF Fellow. So during that one month I have explored and I've listened to many experts in 
this food system. And what I'm doing currently is I'm working on building something of my own start of my own. I'm at a very primitive stage. So this is why I am personally connecting with this SSI SSI sorry, my bad. SSI SLO. Um but I have seen this with me as well as my friends. I have a good sense of science and technology because that's what I've been studying for four years. I know uh, I know a little bit about what does uh, what would attract consumers. I have an idea in my mind. I have discussed that idea with many industry leaders, and I have said that yeah, it's a good idea to pursue. But how to pursue that idea? That is what I am currently exploring for myself, and I believe that with a fellowship of this kind, it is going to guide me and many other students like me. Who are very passionate about uh, giving, uh, providing R&D driven solutions to the industry. So that's about me, and that's why I am associated with SSI Fellowship Research. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. chefs, farmers, and consumers. To bridge that gap, we really need to train our own chefs in that particular direction, where we're teaching them how to build this, uh, bridge this gap, where they have to create this, uh, like there's also demand and supply issue, like you have to create the demand among the chefs where they'll be helping the farmers. So how will you do that? So that will only happen with this particular program, what we are planning, where we'll be training all the chefs from the industry it will be like a three-month kind of a module where we'll be doing a hands-on training uh, with, help, with help of our own uh, uh, industry chefs, as well as the home chefs, where they will be teaching them the regional cuisines, the micro-regional cuisines, the different techniques what we have in India. Uh, we'll be doing education in terms of how to use the local, regional, seasonal produce, so that there will be awareness among all the chefs that how they should be using uh, this particular uh, 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 education system in their own kitchens and in their own organizations. So yeah, that's pretty much about Tiki, which will be starting next year onwards. And yeah, thanks Mr. Agarwal for creating this opportunity for us and for the young generation so that becomes a better future for us. Great, thank you. Okay, yeah. I'm uh, Dhruv. I run this beautiful uh, set of restaurants called Olive. It's one of the iconic properties uh, of India. Uh, for me, the whole movement starts like during COVID period where I was experimenting a lot uh, and I was getting into that healthier mode because COVID has pushed us to eat all things healthy. So we, I thought that time that I will be doing something in direction where I'll be using all things local, all things indigenous uh, in my own cuisine. I run the international food uh, uh, focused restaurant. So for me, it was a challenge. So it, for me, it was a task. So I somehow, uh, you know, educated my own chefs. I've educated myself during COVID that, okay, let me read about it. Let me do some trials. Let me do some experiments and see whether it works. So once uh, the COVID was over, we, uh, we came back to our restaurant. So we did like a menu, which was all which was international recipes paid with all things regional, regional and local. So I almost had a fight with my management then, what the hell are you doing with my restaurant, which is a European restaurant. But I told them, at least try this menu and then we can talk. So ever since, the entire menu is there uh, in the restaurant and uh, very particularly, I think we've been pushing this whole uh, movement. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's pretty much about me. So are you inviting and... everyone to your restaurant? Oh yeah, anytime, anytime. <laughs> On the house? Because they are very expensive. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Now we have a local angle to it. I hope uh, I'll subsidize the price. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so great. So we're going to work on this program very strictly and hopefully we'll be launching this next year onwards. 
So we have got the answer of why and how, and let's see how we execute it. Thank you so much. Smoothly skip that part. Yes, and uh, we must say that we are seeing so many tangible solutions, everyone, from the Good Food uh, Company certificate, the FSIF certificate, Tiki, a uh, great uh, training initiative. Uh, and uh, this is all coming out of the Action Labs. Uh, before we continue towards the Action Lab uh, experts' uh, addresses, we have uh, some special awards and our chief guests' address. Uh, this is a special recognition award and uh, for this we would like to request uh, our uh, chief guest Sri G. Kamlavardhana Rao sir, CEO FSS AI to kindly do the honours and present this award. This uh, special certificate of uh, appreciation going to National Institute of Food Technology, Entrepreneurship and Management Kundli. I request Ms. Monica Chung to kindly come forward and accept this on behalf of Niftim Kundli. <laughs> Ten universities participated and for active participation in this online workshop of Kofti, Niftim is getting recognized and uh, we are also recognizing uh, But Monica, why did you get the award? Tell us something Yes, it. Monica, would you like to share some few Just words? 30 seconds, sir. Hello everyone, Namaste. My name is Monica Chan and I'm a PhD scholar in Niftim Kundli, currently in second year. Just a short story, uh, I have a friend Manisha, she is linked to the Food Future Foundation to the Pawan Agarwal sir. Nepotism. <laughs> it's not about nepotism, it's about how friendship is leading you to the new heights, not only personally but on the professional level also. So yeah, she just asked me for some registrations, but not such as registration, uh, I created a movement there and there were more than uh, 100 students, 60 to 70 BTEC students, PhD scholars, MTech scholars in whole house and we all were sitting there and then we had quiz competition. It just started with a small but then it lead to the like uh, talking about sustainable development, biodegradable plastics and many much. So yeah, it was like that but I'm very fortunate and now I'm not going to leave Food Future Foundation. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much. You. Have a great day. So she's no nepotism. <laughs> Manisha, thank you. <laughs> and uh, also thank you to our uh, next winner for the certificate, uh, Institute of Chemical Technology, Mumbai Bhubaneswar, Orissa. I request Ms. Parul Shukla to kindly come forward and accept it on behalf of the Institute of Chemical Technology. Thank you for your participation and demonstrating exemplary commitment and proactive engagement in the Kofti workshop held on the 5th and 6th October 2023. So you have come all the way, taken out the time and graced uh, this event uh, with your presence. Uh, we would like to definitely hear a few words from you. Please uh, help me in welcoming our Chief Guest CEO FSSAI Shri G. Kamla Vardhan Rao. Thank you so much, Pavan Agarwal, sir, for giving me this opportunity. It is wonderful to see all of you here. Let me tell you this, you know, whatever we have been doing as a regulator of the country in the food uh, sector, but uh, once we see, I really enjoy the children watching here. I must, uh, I'm sir, I'm very thankful to you and uh, congratulate you for getting everybody on the, on, uh, into this room. Uh, this room is uh, really uh, vibrating with uh, so much of energy and so many ideas about the food and regulating the food. Uh, 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 what happens actually Indian, I, I don't say Indian, I think everybody internationally. Human psychology is that uh, uh, if you are rich, you are supposed to be eating more. Number one. And uh, uh, if there is an occasion, the success is always associated with sugar. 
So uh, you pass the examination and uh, you have to have a uh, cake. Then, bacha paida hua, laddu khao. Election mein jiri gaya, laddu khao. Entrance mein pass ho gaya, laddu khao. And the word, tumhari muh mein ghi shakka. That is also one of the worst things. You should ban this. This is HFSS, the child was telling up there previously that uh, high food, high uh, uh, you know, salt and sugar thing. So high salt and sugar is something which is extremely, extremely harmful to us. I don't know why we started, you know, you, you, it, in Sanskrit it is said that, you know, when a child is uh, born in the villages, we say, particularly in South India, I don't know about UP and all, that Shatamanam Bhavati. Shatamanam bhavati shatahyuk purush chatendriye ayishvindriye pratitishtati. So that means live for 100 days. So your man is born for living for 100 days. And what are you eating to live for 100 days? Are we eating the right food or not? Fortunately in India, fortunately in India, we have so much of food production. 100 years back, sir, if you see, there was no food in the world globally. European ships used to come to India and take food, particularly spices. And uh, now we are so rich in food cultivation. 332 billion, uh, 32 billion tons is the food that is produced in this country. 133 million tons of rice, 107 million tons of wheat, 221 million tons of milk, 37.5 million tons of oils, oil seeds, and 28 million tons of pulses. And we, uh, we contribute almost 42% of the bovine meat in the world. So, and vegetables, how much? It is 16.5 million tons is vegetables. Fruits, when you go to Germany, normally when you go abroad, they say that you are living in such a fantastic country. Everything is fresh. In Europe, everything is frozen. My cousin who lives in London goes to a London supermarket and buys a drumstick, that is 3.5 pounds. Two, one drumstick is 3.5 pounds. So point is that you know, we are extremely happy, we are extremely fortunate that we are living in such a wonderful country. But why are we not eating? Why are we not regulating the food that we should be eating? Right? And uh, the world index that is shown here, health index which is shown here. Anyway, there's so much, uh, a lot many uh, reports which I, we don't believe in WHO reports and all. The methodology which they adopted is certainly not scientific. Um, they said that you know, even the micronutrients which are getting into the body is not sufficient, right? That's true. That is why we are doing fortification of the food. Why are we doing fortification of the food? The industry, the global food industry, they are also writing F on the covers. The ITC, Tata ke upar hai, Tata ke upar hai, F, F is fortified. So why are we fortifying? We are fortifying because you are not getting the RDA, that the National Institute of Nutrition which gives that RDA, the recommended right elements for one day, the calorie. What is the food a child requires? What is the food that a mother requires? How much, uh, how much, how much micronutrients a pregnant lady requires? An army soldier requires. A sports person requires. We have regulations with us, and in that, you know, these are the uh, NIN's, uh, 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 NIN's recommendations are involved in this by our scientific panels, and we mention there that these are the micronutrients. I B12 is very less. 37.5 percent of uh, pregnant ladies in this country they suffer from anemia. Right? Children suffer from any, but where do you get the iron content from? It must get into, from, from, from the food itself. So how do you get this food? So that public distribution. We have the wonderful public distribution system in the, in, in the world. India has the best public, public distribution system. We, we spend 9.2 billion uh, dollars only on public distribution system. We have more than 5 lakh ration shops which are getting, and school uh, secretary, uh, school education has already mentioned about it, right? So only just few things I have mentioned about our regulations of FSSA, that this labeling regulations are very important, which is safe. We, we have punishments for safe food, uh, uns unsafe food, suppose if you are misbranded food. So for misbranded food, if you are saying that, no, this is rich, iron rich, so uh, I don't want to take the names of the companies. They mentioned that, you know, this is, uh, uh, soya, soya rich. Then in, in, in just bottom of that, in a small letter, they say flavor. So it's only say soya flavor. It's highly misleading. Similar kind of advertisements in the packages by multinational companies also. And I have requested them. The, yesterday we had all the 
uh, CMDs and the managing directors and CEOs of multinational companies there in the past floor where Commerce Minister was also there. We were there interacting with them. I requested that, right? You don't put in the labels, you don't put the information which is not required for the consumer. Put only the minimum thing what is happening and but the most important what is your ESP. So that is one thing, but ultimately the behavioral, uh, this, the, uh, this uh, madam is here, the behavioral sciences and all, people have to change their habits. Unless, people, that, for that, generating awareness is very important. FSSA started generating awareness on each right papers. So we have regulations for organic, uh, organic uh, food, we have regulations for oils and fats, we have regulation, regulations for the milk and milk products, we have regulations for the meat. 200 scientists sit together and evolve this legal framework, this, this regulatory <coughs> framework for the entire country. So for this, it is not that you know, just sitting here, uh, sitting in our office and uh, all the scientists uh, 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 just uh, pass certain res regulations on that. Draft regulations are notified and after that we, we, we invite rec uh, recommendations and the remarks from the entire civil society, from the stakeholders. All of you must participate in that. And for nutraceutical regulations, we, we did the same thing. For every regulation we do, but for nutraceutical regulations, because it's very, very, very important, because health supplements are involved in this. <coughs> so health supplements, you know, mushrooming now, the majority of the companies from, from, from USA, from Canada, from Japan, from Korea, all of them are, they are available in the market now. They're dumping. I don't remember when the children said, you also agree with me that, you know, we used to have chocolate only for 15th August and January 26th. It's not that we were poor uh, as a child, uh, but we could afford the chocolates and all. But the habit is only to eat sweet, uh, excess sweet is all. Uh, last birthday I must tell you, sir, this uh, cake cutting thing. We must think about cake cutting should be replaced by fruit cutting. So I, start, I celebrated my birthday by avoiding the cake. My daughter was getting me, Papa, this is for food, cake cutting. I said, what is this in this cake? What are the ingredients in this? How much is I'm eating now? Right? Cake at bakeries, thousands of bakeries have mushroom on every day. I'm not uh, denying that you should not eat cakes, you eat cakes, but you know, how frequently eating cake is, how do you digest that? So, people are going for the habit, uh, the, the trends are changing, right? Food, the food habits are changing. Intermittent fasting, it has come up now. Uh, many, the, for aged people, their autophagy is what the, the, the thing in the world is autophagy. Don't eat. Don't eat. Stop eating for some time. So one week and uh, one uh, one day in one week. Don't eat. So let the cell eat the dead cells. The living cell eats the dead cells. Okay. Enjoy. Hunger is an addiction. This is what one scientist told me. Okay? Keep your stomach hung hungry and then you think of see the magic in your body. Right? But children, you can't force. You know, my son. Was uh, when he was 10th class, he was uh, 120 kgs. He used to finish, I'm from Hyderabad, so two Hyderabadi biryanis he finished off at one meal, right? So he used to grow, grow like that, and when he started playing cricket, he's a, he's a serious cricketer. He couldn't bowl faster. Then he started reducing himself. Then he, he only, for one month, he lived only on soups. Automatically, this entire baby fat got reduced. And uh, last uh, five years, he's on the serious, serious uh, weight lifting mode, and uh, that's a different story. But uh, uh, how do you control or how do you educate uh, the children? So this is the best thing what Pawan Agarwal sir is doing. Bringing out uh, a scientific curriculum to the children, telling them what to eat, when to eat. See, when to eat is important and the combination of eating is also very important. Doctor prescribe you D-vitamin. <coughs> D-vitamin, they say, they eat some fat, fat related. Cheese, cow, is quite fat soluble, right? Iron fortification we're talking about. Iron cannot go get into your body, then the, the body track and get uh, the bioavailability. The bioavailability will be increased only when you have C vitamin with that. If you don't have C vitamin, iron is not there. So this combination of food is also <coughs> extremely important. In the, I'm sure your grand, grandparents must have told you don't eat egg and bitter gourd and some, some yeah. funny combinations. So I used to think that what is this funny combination? But maybe that was scientific, but modern science has evolved so much that must be telling the children calculate before you eat. Just think how many vitamins you are eating. You should not say that, you know. You should think about whether it's going to help my brain, heart, lungs, kidney, 
for now. All, for all the vital organs, whether it, if it is helping you, don't try to satisfy your tongue. Satisfy the human, other faculties of the human body. So this, I think this is this endeavor by Pavan Agarwal sir is extremely important. It will go very well. We also wanted to start health clubs in all the schools. Um, uh, sir, with uh, your support and all, you know, we want more kind of foundations like this in every state. Big India is a massive, massive country. Uh, government cannot reach out to each and every part to educate the people. Uh, all we have just taken initiative to uh, to train all the food handlers in all the SC, ST, BC hostels and other hostels of IITs, IEMs, and central universities and all. So. Uh, uh, the, the foundations like yours, NGOs like yours, will definitely um, help in public in getting more awareness about HFSS and uh, maybe that uh, Aishman Bhava, the massive program of Government of India, will be realized with this kind of program. Thank you so much, Namaste. With the IAS, we have always had a problem when an IAS officer was made an excise commissioner who never drank. He did not take alcohol. We have a food safety, zero food safety. He does not take food outside. Yeah. <laughs> Only home cooked meals. Great, leading by example. I must tell you this, this is my personal choice. You know, I don't drink anything outside. I used to be CMD, ITDC and DG Tourism of Government of India, all the hotels. Whenever I go to the hotels and all, my food will come out. Flights also, in the flights, all the flights, you know, I'm not joking, last 10 years, I carry my food. Everybody will be in Indigo food, Vistara, uh, Vistara food. My wife tells me, why are you taking this? Like a villager. So, uh, my wife tells me, like a villager, you're carrying this? Yes, I remove my chicken, everybody will watch everything at home. That's my personal choice. Yes, thank you, sir. We really commend your uh, discipline uh, on food and uh, thank you so much for giving us so much food for thought and uh, for all the great uh, information that you shared in your address. Thanks a lot. And uh, we would like to continue with our Action Labs uh, presentations from our experts. I would also request. Uh, Mr. Philip Deres Rousseau from uh, WHH to kindly join us on stage. So please sit here with us. The next uh, work area that we'll be covering is uh, diets and consumption. And for this, I would like to invite from National Institute of Nutrition, Dr. Subha Rao. Good evening, uh, very late in the evening. I know when Pawan sir shifts from that seat to this seat, he's keeping time. <laughs> and he's asking you to uh, speak sense. And uh, talking of butterflies today, uh, I don't have butterflies on my shirt, but definitely I have some in my tummy now. <laughs> because everything that I need to speak has already been spoken. And speaking of elephants, the elephant in the room is the dice. And that's where we are all worried about. Can I have a presentation quickly? <clears throat> Yeah, uh, this is about the food environment, taking a, a larger perspective uh, of how we choose our foods is not just defined by uh, what we like, but also what is available, what is made available, what is shown to be good, what is not known to be good. Usually we don't go by what is known to be good, we usually go by what is shown to be good. And that's how this slide talks about how a child's food environment is shaped it's by, uh, you know, what the parents give, what they culturally get, what the advertising talks about, and what the school environment is all about, and what the home environment is all about. So, uh, changing things uh, with the kids is not just about telling them uh, what is good nutrition, it's also telling uh, others who influence their nutrition, and that's where the coalition is working on. It's talking about the industry, it's talking about the behaviors, it talk, it's talking about the advertisements, it's talking about larger perspectives. But of course, that doesn't stop us from uh, building the necessary skills among kids about diets and the consumption, and that's where the first action lab uh, works on. Uh, I'll just show you this uh, plate, which is also used uh, by the foundation and the coalition partners in uh, nutri uh, nutrition literacy. 
food literacy. Uh, there is a small revision in the plate that you've been using. I request you to change and use this. This is just a request for the foundation. Uh, this is how uh, an ideal 2000 kilocalorie plate should look like. In the sense that if you put all the raw food that you need in a day to meet the 2000 kilocalorie diet, it should look like this. It's, this. it's not one time that you have to have all this, it's for the day. And it should be half, it should be fruit and vegetable, any seasonal fruit and vegetable. And of that about 100 grams should be fruit, fresh fruit, regionally grown, locally grown, and vegetable uh, on the uh, other 350 grams. Cereal, uh, not more than 240, of which 30 to 40 percent can be millets. Somebody tells you only millets are the panacea for everything. No, don't take it. And then there is also oil, fat, uh, nuts, and protein-rich foods like you know dals and then egg and depending on your choice. So th those are roughly the proportions. If you see the ideal plate and what India eats, can I have the next slide? This is the ideal plate, and this is what the rural India eats. We don't have diet data in India after 2012. This is from 2012. The, the next diet data at a national level is getting generated by our institute very soon, probably next year we'll have. But, but the point that I'm trying to make is, against the ideal of half plate being fruit and vegetable, India eats half plate of cereal, grain, and that too <coughs> majorly rice and wheat. And it's not diversified adequately. The point that someone was making about the diversity, the diet diversity, why we need diverse, di diverse diets? Because no one food is rich in all nutrients. That's a simple message that the children have to know. So this is rural India, this is how India eats. Milk, we are the highest producers in the world, but unfortunately we drink very less. Fruits, as we said, we are second highest or first highest producers in the world. All horticulture products, still we are very bad at it. Next please. Urban India with better availability or accessibility, is it any better? No, it's, it's just the same. And the most concerning part is the 117 gram of average that we have seen on the orange side there. Ultra processed food is definitely a part of what we are consuming. So this is because it's just not because we are unaware. It is also because uh, affordability, accessibility, availability, accommodation and acceptability. The five A's of food environment are compromised some way or the other. Next please. So from research also we see that schools in India, uh, they, uh, uh, you know, the consumption of HFS schools is very high. And then the eating patterns have, uh, uh, have drastically changed over a period of time. The next slide, please. And if you see why this is happening, the industry spends a lot of money on advertising and marketing. <coughs> this is a recent statistics. If you see, the uh, advertising spends are highest in FMCG product, products. And uh, that's up to the tune of 25.6 crores. And of that, 20% is food and beverage industry. Can I have? Yeah, 20% is food and beverage industry. And then if you see uh, the top spenders in FMCG, the top, of the top 16, at least 12 are food uh, companies. Next please. And against that, what we as a, uh, you know, government or as individual institutes do and spend on popularizing nutrition uh, is minuscule. Uh, and then, uh, of course, digital platforms are also, WHO also has raised this concern that Digital platforms are also becoming avenues for marketing of food and advertising of food for kids. And that's where their environment is again compromised. So what do they need? They need important skills of, next please. Important, yeah, child is not spared anywhere. Home, school, community, and digital media, wherever the child is from one of our studies. You see, whether it's newspaper or television at home, or maybe, uh, uh, you know, at, in the, at, at the school level, or at the community level, or at the digital level, there are different different kinds of uh, uh, many kinds of appeals that the industry uses to. Uh, I'm not saying that all the food that the industry sells is bad, but you know, uh, on this from this platform, the prime minister also has given uh, impetus and onus on the need for processing food because without processing the food, you cannot increase the shelf life, retain the nutrients, send it out to people, and then what is produced in one place cannot go to the other. But there is a difference between processing the food and encouraging the processed food industry, ultra processed food industry. That balance we have to strike and that's what has come out clearly in the uh, address of the CEO as well as uh, uh, Pawan sir. 
So this is how, uh, uh, you know, this is the scenario in which while we work on other platforms of the environment, the child's literacy is very, very important. And three important skills the child has to know. One is to be able to differentiate between what is healthy and unhealthy, whether it is made at home or away from home. Pizza made at home is pizza is as unhealthy as that is made outside if, it, if the ingredients are same, right? And then uh, what is available locally and then what nutritious food can be chosen from the available resources instead of trying for something uh, from far away or exotic. And third and most important is being able to read the food labels and make a judgment on uh, the food. But for these three skills, uh, the children need to have an overall understanding of food and that's where the eight different parameters of food literacy that have been talked about uh, by the children in their play are at play in the food literacy uh, part of uh, our group. Next, please. Yeah, I mean, this is the reality that we all know. Next. So what's good food? Good food means eating a diverse range of diets. That's what you said. And proper sleep. That's also is important. Uh, and then, uh, next, please. Yeah, knowledge is the key. And not, just, just not a knowledge. The knowledge should be skill-based. And that's the endeavor of uh, the, the working group. And uh, that's how the literacy is being uh, planned. The nutrition literacy is being planned. Next, please. Yeah, uh, that's it. And uh, through this is this is going to happen through educating the uh, teachers first, and through teachers to the students, and students again can uh, influence their own families, friends, and also it can be a larger movement. But it should start somewhere, and it should start with the kids, and then their future is. Uh, in their hands and uh, not just in our hands. Next, please. Thank you very much. These are all the partners, and uh, thanks for the opportunity given. And NIM is very happy to be part of this uh, entire endeavor in any way uh, that the foundation requests NIM to be part. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Banao. I think uh, National Institute of Nutrition, which is the apex. Uh, you know, research institution for nutrition. Your partnership is so important for the cohesion. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, because it is through you that we can reach out and uh, to the community and the credibility of the work that we are doing as far as what is good nutrition and what do we, how do we teach it, etc., etc. So thank you very much. You know, Prof. Subhan is also always very supportive in the work of the group. Thank you so much, sir. I think that reflects your real passion for uh, food nutrition and what you shared there, uh, the ideal plate and versus the rural and the urban plate is quite a, a wake-up call, I must say, uh, along with some uh, inconvenient truths that we must digest. So before, before you move on, you know, I would like to recognize Ria Gaba. Uh -huh. uh, Ria, why don't you come? And so she's basically the person who is handling the Action Lab 1. She made a beautiful, very nice presentation <laughs> uh, in, on food literacy earlier, but she's also handling action lab. Would you like to say something? Yeah, a few words from you. <laughs> she's also my eldest staff on the team of Food Future Foundation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pamela, for your kind words. And you, under your guidance, I have been learning a lot and a lot every day. With little scoldings, but yeah. <laughs> 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 but that scoldings only have transformed us to a better, better version of ourselves. Thank you so much, sir, for having us. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we will now be hearing uh, on the work area of uh, agroecology and small holding farmers. On behalf of Mr. Minhas Amin, uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Philip uh, Dres Rasso from WHH, who will also be adding about local action for holistic food system transformation in his address. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you. Yes, I'm a bit a lost child, but I found my mother now. I think I'm very happy to be in this lab. It's a wonderful lab. Agroecology and small farmers. First, the action lab, and then you can come. That's the action lab. I'm presenting now what the action lab does. I'm not, I'm not, yes, maybe you should go back. 
but I'm not really looking at the power of a presentation because my my uh, member, my Action Lab member left me <laughs> and he was supposed to present it. I'm not really sure, I'm not very clear what he, he drafted. But anyway, um, I think that's a really uh, interesting lab and it's a very important lab because this lab will bring everything together which we have discussed here on a local level. It will bring it down to the rural communities. And uh, the main, I mean, the main the center of, of, of uh, whom we work are the smallholder farmers and uh, India has uh, I think 130 million smallholder farmers I heard but maybe it's even more the world has 500 million farmers according to the FAO so there's a huge amount of uh, smallholder farmers in India and they're doing already a very good job they're, they produce more than 70% of the food consumed in India so we are representing these farmers. I don't look like an Indian farmer, but I still represent them. And uh, we are also representing a huge network of, uh, of NGOs, of experts, of institutions, supporting these smallholder farmers in India. And I believe that smallholders shouldn't be beneficiaries. They're actually the key solution for our food system crisis and our climate crisis. So if we support them, um, I think we can do a tremendous uh, transformation. Um, the problem is a little bit that these farmers are not part of the trillion dollar food business which has been presented, not at all, uh, even though they're doing a very good job. And they used to do an even better job, I think, before the, the Green Revolution in India not long time ago where they, they produced in harmony with nature, with very integrated farming systems, a huge amount of, of diverse food. And here India is actually much more far ahead than Europe, because our food, so-called industrial revolution, was long time ago, and we don't even have farmers anymore who know how to farm in harmony with nature, how to, to farm in an integrated manner where all the elements are combined in such a pro proportion that each element supports each other, each other and, and not requiring a lot of external inputs such as pesticides or hybrids, etc. Um, etc. Et the problem is a little bit how do we connect now these farmers to, uh, to, 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 um, to markets? Um, the rural economies now in India are not really smallholder friendly. They are not really clean, green, and fair, I would say. Uh, more and more companies, and we also talked about this, are dominating these rural economies and are flooding basically uh, these villages with, with cheap fast food, Maggi, uh, Coca-Cola, I don't want to name everybody. But it just go, and they're also polluting these areas with plastic, because uh, most of the food is processed and highly packaged. Um, so I think, and that will be one one task, major task of of, of the lab, is to, to to recreate and to support local economies which are totally different, which follow a different paradigm, um, a paradigm which is not only based on on the capitalist paradigm, which goes beyond uh, a food system which will might look different, where. Um, Food is not only a commodity, where food again is, is an identity and culture, we also have talked about it, where mass consumption is not the focus, where basically local quality consumption becomes a focal focus again, um, etc., etc. So I don't want to get too much on, on uh, the 13 principles of agroecology because that's a little bit our guiding framework which goes beyond production, production, which also will tackle you know, issues like, like, like local uh, marketing, regional marketing, uh, consumer awareness, uh, food government, which is important, which hasn't been a topic really so far. Um, and um, yes, I think I will just present the initiative. We have a little bit brainstormed in the, in the last weeks, also with Pavan. Uh, we call the initiative LIFT, with an H, uh, which stands for Local Innovation for Holistic Food System Transformation. 
So everybody agrees today that food system transformation is urgently needed. There's no doubt about it. Um, but that this food transformation can only happen through a, through a holistic, through an integrated uh, approach with, with multiple, multiple stakeholders in, involved. And that's, of course, a challenge because nobody really knows how to do that. Um, so in recent years, multiple frameworks have been developed uh, describing how sustainable, uh, inclusive and resilient food system can be uh, or should be created. And I think now it's time for practice. And uh, one of these frameworks, like I, like I just mentioned, are based on these 13 principles of agroecology. Um, and our Action Lab is now proposing to showcase, or better, to demonstrate um, such an implementation uh, um, um, model based on, on this food system framework in a specific region, um, in a specific landscape of two or three districts. Um, the initiative LIFT will closely collaborate, of course, with the six Action Labs of the coalition. Uh, many government institutions, many NGOs, many development organizations, but also the private sector, we can could see it today, have created uh, amazing innovation, have done an amazing work on different aspects of the food systems. And I think now it's time to really get together these, in, uh, these interventions, these, these best practices uh, and these models uh, and to implement them on a local level under one uh, food system approach. LIFT will focus on four main important elements of the food system. The first one, and I think that's very important, not only for urban areas, but also for rural areas, it's food literacy. Uh, so to bring, bring uh, food literacy uh, back to the schools, to the rural schools. And uh, it's quite funny, most of the rural schools are in a rural setup and are living with nature. And most of these kids will or might go into agriculture but food and agriculture is not a topic at school at all. And I think that's something which needs to change. I never understood. You're working, you know, with, with, with rural communities. You have school there, and so why do they don't, why don't they talk about, why, about the environment, you know, and about agriculture? Uh, the second one is nutrition education, behavior change was a big topic. Here to really work with the Anandwadi, to work with the Ashas, to work with the teachers on how to change uh, behavior in, in rural communities as well. Um, the second uh, big element is, is food system governance. Here we also need local system, food system leadership. So not only on, an, on a national level or on a state level, we need it also in the communities. So we need to target Gran uh, Panchayats, we need to target community-based organization, we need to target self-help groups and building this food system or system thinking towards uh, uh, food systems. Uh, we also need to support the development of nutrition sensitive uh, micro plants or nutrition sensitive uh, uh, village development plants that's important. GPDP, how do we introduce a food systems approach into uh, GPDP? The third one, the third element is of course sustainable and resilient uh, agriculture, but here I'm not so so worried because a lot of work has been done in the last 15 years in India and India is at the front when it comes to sustainable agriculture. Um, India has launched a lot of big programs on sustainable agriculture, natural farming movement, I just name it, organic, PGS was promoted. So here a lot of knowledge is, 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 is available. It's just a matter of consolidating it and, and showing a, a facilitation uh, a model on how to work together with farmers. And the last aspect is, of course, equitable livelihoods. I talked about it already, with a strong focus on creating smallholder-friendly markets which are clean, green, and fair. So the main objective of, of LIFT is, is to demonstrate an implementation model for sustainable local food system transformation, and a model which we can not only scale in India, uh, but also uh, in other countries worldwide. The unit of command for this initiative, and I think that's a good idea, will be the magistrate, the district magistrate, the magistrates, 
uh, the magistrates will coordinate and supervise all the activities, the interventions. They will also uh, make sure that convergence is happening. And the idea is that these magistrates will receive technical support from an institution which... Yes. Okay. Uh, from an institution which we, we will call uh, the Food System Academy. The Food System Academy will closely work with the coalition, report to the coalition, and then uh, implement the different interventions uh, uh, with the ideas green colleges, uh, which will provide capacity building um, to the CDEOs, but also the government <laughs> extension. So I hope that uh, we can achieve a butterfly effect with that one. Um, small. Yeah, and I think small, very concrete local action can also create and will create concrete change also at the bigger level, on the, the bigger local, um, on the bigger food system um, in India. And uh, yes, as Gandhi says, um, the future of India lays in its villages, so I think it's important also to focus there. Thank you very much. in terms of the literacy parts, how the curriculums are being developed, to shape how students, uh, hospitality institutes and all are. I think one of the big challenges is the agriculture universities. It's not just the schools. None of the universities on agriculture teach on natural and resilient agriculture. So I think it's very important for this thematic track to pick up on that at a level. There's some work which has started, but if we don't change the larger industrial agriculture mindset of the people who are going and teaching agriculture or practicing agriculture or measuring agriculture, things will not change. Thank you. You know, incidentally, you know, uh, Philip uh, is from WHH, which brings out the world, the global hunger report. We don't agree with them on that, but we are completely aligned as far as their work on local food system transformation is concerned. This initiative and the logo, Butterfly in Lift, is an entire innovation of failure. We really appreciate it. I'm sure that <laughs> Lift will make the butterfly fly in local areas. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Yes, there is a popular song, Thori Si To Lift Kara De. So, you know, so yes, uh, we'll definitely lift the butterfly uh, further, higher, uh, and uh, uh, farther away. So, uh, reaching new grounds and uh, also finding new collaborations. Thank you so much, sir, for adding that remark. And uh, thank you, Mr. Philip, for your refreshingly witty style of presentation, along with uh, your, uh, uh, you know, very uh, good uh, uh, inputs on uh, the teaching of agriculture in schools. I can also see you're wearing a kalava, so you have definitely integrated well into the culture, <laughs> the local culture. Yeah, that's wonderful. It's good to know. I hope uh, you had a good time there. Thank you. And uh, now I would like to invite for the next uh, Action Lab presentation on food environments. This uh, will be done by conservation architect, one station million stories, Miss Somi Chatterjee. I also curate stories, but today I'm going to be talking about the story of recreational eating. Something that we are so good at doing. We don't register, we talk about children and their diet, but we are all guilty of it. And this is where it starts. Yeah, the next one, please. So, of course, my presentation, I'm going to be banking on my skills as an architect, urban planner, and in that genre. So, of course, informal economy and lack of comprehensive city food strategy, something in between. Next slide, please. Um, so what I did find is that uh, food environment, and I'm talking about the spatial environment, uh, it's a $65 billion worth industry and that 50%, 60 lakhs people are depend on it. So imagine the number of consumers that it affects. So I'll go straight down to this place as in where does all of this act up. Next. So we're looking at the cusp between this market and the disposal ground where the urban and rural area meet. I'm looking at street vendors and food. That's where urban India eats. 
and a large section of population we eat. So, and mind you, this is a condition that we are all familiar with. We've all eaten from this, but we quietly don't talk about it, and trust me, even planners don't know how to address it. I'm looking at the potential of uh, transforming or catapulting this into mainstream economy, regularizing it, but through the urban planning lens. Okay, go to the next one. Uh, all that urban planning provides is this one guide book uh, and some few very basic drawings. And people who work with food vendors and food in general would understand these drawings or these regulations won't suffice. Because uh, if city planning and management have to look at food environment through the lens of health determinants, uh, you have to look at how the support system for economy, how the image of city transforms with food, and for how it does it for present and future generation. Can you go to the next one? Well, uh, while I can spend hours on all of these lovely pictures, but I will just go straight down to the contributor in regeneration or revitalizing the urban space through food. Next one? Yeah. So that's the image on the right is a smart city mission project that was introduced in Smart City Kolkata, the new town area. All it did was it regularized the street, made it clean, just got food truck. And if you go by the figures that came for just nighttime economy, that was phenomenal. I don't have the figures with me right now, but you could just contact the mission. The point is our master plans do not uh, acknowledge the potential of food-based areas. That's where it becomes legally as if it doesn't exist. Second part of the problem is there is no allocation of space. While the allocation has to be on a larger scale for space for building, waste management, uh, safety, and all of this based on carrying capacity of anchor points. And when I say anchor point, I talk about offices. I talk about outside of schools, colleges, especially colleges and offices because the age group between 22 to 35 eats out of that vending scenario. So your onset of diabetes to cholesterol, everything, every other parameter or people in the panel talked about gets you know, introduced there and sustained in that one sentence. Uh, well, street and public design, you can't just do with few sketches. I wish there was a little more regularization there as architects, we can do more. And yes, go back to introduce the public health parameters and planning, something that we've just a bit forgotten. So I believe the panel sitting here have more to contribute to augmenting planning than the other way around in a certain extent. So I see a scope of convergence where we can diversify off offering and make sure quality control also happens in outdoor food and recreational eating. Because if we are tasting um, sauce, if we are tasting junk food on a daily basis, we are not going to go back to healthy eating. Next. Um, I just hope that uh, making healthy cities become a mandatory parameter and sometimes a little push matters, so something like a smart city giving an acknowledgement for a food-based food might just be an incentive. So I hope this panel and everybody sitting here gives that push. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So she's just a new member of our coalition. <laughs> because food environments are something uh, that, uh, at least in India, there's no special focus. There uh, are city-based food environments, which are becoming more and more unhealthy, driven by commercial considerations. Uh, so I think uh, a lot of work is required to be done in this space. And uh, thank you. You know, Swami, you know, he reached out to School of Planning and Architecture, and many schools of, you know, I, I don't think they actually even bother about it. Forget about government. So, I think this is an area which requires a lot more attention because you eat food. There are not many people who carry food all the time, like uh, COFSSCI. Most of them <coughs> buy food wherever they are visiting. And therefore, food environment, say, if you are hungry here, you know, we'll have to buy food from the places that are selling food in this place. So is the food environment in Pagati Menan healthy? I don't know. So I think these are the challenges one need to address as we move forward. And uh, they are not very difficult to address actually. Why?
food environments at national level cannot be, you know, changed. But food environments, micro food environments can be better regulated. With a little thought, say ITPO, if it, if it makes a mandation, that no food stalls within the passion uh, that has lead, led us to this day and to this moment and uh, uh, thanks so much Ms. Somi uh, for sharing that quite an aspirational idea but still I think that uh, these are the ideas that will actually lead to uh, that final solution that we are trying to get at uh, we have two more presentations to go uh, the next presentation is on Action Lab and after that we have a presentation from uh, GIZ the Action Lab presentation is on food waste and food loss. And for this, I would like to invite from India Food Banking Network, Ms. Vandana Singh. Good evening, everyone. Uh, over the last two months, I think uh, I have already spoken on the subject almost a dozen times. And I'm just so glad that uh, this issue has come to the forefront of discussion and action uh, in the recent uh, times. So all of us are very aware of the food that we see that goes waste, uh, sometimes at our household level, sometimes we see at events and functions and weddings, uh, etc. And food waste, uh, it is often said that almost one third of the food produced in the world goes waste. You know, it almost amounts to that you buy three apples and before you enter your house, you throw one apple outside. Yeah, it's literally that. And therefore, this, this subject is really very important. You cannot just keep producing food, throwing away one third of it, and then expect to feed the growing population. Here, we would just like to make a differentiation between what is food loss and what is food waste. Generally, whatever is uh, not available for consumption, whatever food is not available for consumption, between the farm um, and, you know, towards a, a farm, transportation, distribution, and up to the retail sector, that loss is regarded as food loss. And thereafter, at the retail level or at the household level, whatever food is not available for consumption, is not used for consumption, is called food waste. Uh, so what are the solutions to this food loss or this food waste which is taking place? Uh, we are first talking about food waste. Uh, in the supply chain, <coughs> there is food which is uh, wasted on the shelves and warehouses of food companies, the processing food industry. And then we also have cooked food which, is, which goes waste in the hotels, restaurants, caterers and at the household level. And we need different strategies to handle this food waste um, for this different, uh, at, the, at these different levels. Uh, at the food industry level, the packaged food level. Uh, I think this is quite clear. We can move on. Okay. So, and at the cooked food also, we could talk about, you know, uh, the portion size in the restaurants, etc. And then. One thing is about preventing food from going waste and the other thing is that if at all there is waste which is happening then how it can be best utilized. So there are recovery agencies uh, which uh, collect this food to which you can donate this food and they can use this food for distributing it to people in need. Uh, both the packaged food and the cooked food, there are recovery agencies which are working on this and they can distribute it to people in uh, the slums, in um, old age homes, homeless shelters, etc. For food loss also, there are different strategies. Uh, one thing is that we need to know exactly how much is the food loss and here the Action Lab, uh, we intend to, you know, do some regular surveys along with Indian Council of Agricultural Research and collect data on what is the amount of uh, post-harvest losses in, uh, in different uh, produce. And so, you know, since we have, uh, you know, Mr. Dhingra. Uh, Mr. Dhingra here, why did you come, you know, just 30 seconds on food loss because he's, he's the person on food loss. Uh, I have uh, almost spoken about the processed food industry and the cooked food. You can just complete yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one minute. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs>
Good evening, everyone, and thanks to Mr. Pawan Agarwal for founding this Food Future Foundation and also inviting me in his uh, previous program. Today, I was stuck in another meeting of there, so I have to speak on brains for it. So, food loss has been very integral to me since I started uh, learning post harvest technology, and uh, I focus less on processed products and more on <coughs> up to primary processing. That the food, when it goes from the farmer, and it reaches either the factory or your household in its raw form. So in this food loss, I will categorize that we have uh, food grains which are given. So they need a different technology. We have perishable, which are fruits and vegetables. We have raw mosses in that. And we need different technologies for that. And ICR is working on all these approaches. Where is milk and wheat? So when we first talk about agricultural system <coughs> transformation, we have seen from deficient to surplus food. Now we have surplus and we are number one in many commodities, not even one. We are number one in production in many commodities. So now our onus is, now we are looking at food loss at least. When we were deficient, we were not worried about that. But now we are more worried about food loss and food waste. And whatever food we are wasting, we are also wasting our natural resources. We are wasting the walk down the coil which the farmers, they go to the open sun, they go and do the tilling, right? So that is also wasted. So, in the earlier, before Mr. Pawan Agarwal may not know, I had come to this hall and I was listening to food literacy by some of the panelists. So, I will only add one point that in food literacy, if food safety has not been included, please include food safety aspect also. If we, if we cook the food, if we don't preserve it properly, we will waste it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I would like to add that. Full team on that. Yes, so that is very important. Give him a copy of the food literacy. Yes, I will need that. Because I will also take it to some of the schools where I am linked up with. So in case of uh, post-harvest losses, in case of cereals and pulses, we have uh, around 3 to 5 percent. In case of fruits and vegetables, it goes up to 15 percent. Milk is quite less, less than 1 percent. And in our country, we have seen that milk has, milk and dairy products, they have seen a lot of transformation, industries have come up. A lot of processing is being done, value addition and packaging. So its shelf life is in us. So it is less loss over there. But in case of uh, food grains, or in case of fruits and vegetables, shelf life enhancement is still needed in our country, and we need to pump in more technologies, more investments. I think I have covered one minute. If you give me yeah. more time, I can no, no. speak. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so here, I will thank Mr. Pawan Agarwal and his team for uh, creating this elaborate group, Food Future Foundation, and bringing in people from all walks of life. I had listened to just a few minutes to nutritionists and uh, so much energy. I think we also need architects to build storage structures. And uh, whatever you have talked about, food safety, food safety also comes into that part, right? And uh, I would also like to eat healthy. I don't want to get sick. I have also had some problems at this time where I am telling my men, don't put oil in the heat like a nation. <laughs> Who will teach all of that? Right? <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Dr. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Dr. Thank you, sir. That was our presentation on food waste and food loss. I'm going to try some German now. Fristi, meaning understand. Omamun, meaning embrace. And Fena Enden, meaning transform. This is the philosophy of GIZ. And we are now about to get a brief presentation from GIZ side. I would like to invite nutrition advisor of GIZ, Ms. Nadeen Badr. Please welcome Ms. Nadeen. Did she say it right? Yeah. Okay. I must thank Lisa for it. Thank you. Um, so, I'm not sure if many of you know, it's um, a portfolio that comprises several topics. You can see here our clusters. One is um, projects that evolve around energy, some about around sustainable urban industrial development, economic 
development, and then the one which I present today, the Environment, Climate Change, and Biodiversity Cluster, which comprises almost 40 projects. And I'm focusing now on those which are related to food systems directly. But since we heard today about the street vendors and smart cities, we also have in our other clusters some relevant projects, and we can also think how through the coalition some co-creation could happen in them. Next slide, please. Yeah, so here are some of the very obvious projects in our portfolio. Out of these almost 40 projects, you see we have a big pro program. It's a lighthouse between the German and the Indian government on agroecology. This project is called Support to Agroecological Transformation Processes. Then we have also projects around soil health management, about nutrition security, around sustainable aquaculture, and so on. One of them you can see on the bottom right, this is the transformative initiative for food system transformation called TESS. This is the program with which we are supporting and working together with Food Future Foundation to set up this coalition for food system transformation. Next slide, please. Here I would like to briefly take you on the journey of thinking holistically when it comes to food systems transformation through agroecology. In our cluster, we have developed an integrated framework based on this UN food systems framework and the 13 agroecological principles. We were really thinking how to bring it together so that we, are, that we are able to see our portfolio in a way to understand to which extent we are already contributing to food systems transformation through agroecology, how we can coordinate action better between the projects, how we can leverage the synergies, address gaps and trade-offs. And I'm presenting that today because this could also be a tool for the coalition to see how the different action labs can work together and leverage their action. Next slide. So what we made out of these two international frameworks from food systems and agroecology is what you can see here. It's an integrated framework with 10 pathways, a theory of change that leads to a sustainable and healthy diets within planetary boundaries. Next slide, please. We have piloted this um, tool at our cluster level with 10 selected projects. And here you can also see TSZ projects have a standard in terms of always working together with the government partners. So you can see that these 10 projects are already covering uh, six political partners. We have only with these 10 projects uh, 16 states covered and the different thematic areas. And this is just a small part of the Indo-German cooperation portfolio. Next slide, please. So, and here I brought you one example where we have um, a local food systems strengthening approach for diverse diets, which may go in hand with LIFT, what um, Philip also presented. So we are having here an integrated approach where we're linking agroecological community nutrition gardens, which are supported under MG and Rega, to improve the availability and access to nutritious foods with social and behavior change nutrition education that are delivered by the Anganwadi workers at village level. So we're trying here to bring in an approach that really goes from farm to fork and this is also where different projects of our cluster are working together to make this happen. Next slide please. So the main findings from our portfolio analysis were basically that we have linkages to all these 10 pathways of this integrated framework. And this means we have a strong basis for food systems approach. The major focus, however, in our cluster lays on production systems and increasing agroecosystem synergies. So we see there also the potential to increase um, a focus on the demand side, food environments, and consumer behaviors. Recommendations from this analysis as of now are that we can use that tool to promote integrated solutions to coordinate action on the ground and to leverage synergies and avoid trade-offs. If you are more interested around this, um, about this integrated framework, you can also scan this QR code. This leads to our policy brief that we uh, published under the T20 call for abstracts. Yeah. With that, that was a very brief introduction to what we're doing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nadeen, and I would like to now invite uh, CEO Food Future Foundation, Mr. Pavan Agarwal. To thank. <laughs> okay, so, you know, like many people have left, my wife had also left. <laughs> I know you're going to uh, speak in the end, speak for half an hour, 
Then I promised her that I'll be very brief. So I said, I prepared two verses of my thank you note. First is thank you, thank you. And second version is thank you very much. <laughs> okay, no, I picked up this from somewhere. So <laughs> I'll still speak for a few minutes. <laughs> I think uh, this was, in some sense, an extension of the workshop that we had in uh, Hotel Meridian a few weeks ago. And uh, it is very heartening to see that, uh, uh, that many of you, despite you know, all the problems that were there in reaching the venue <laughs> and then maintaining the times and all that, have braved and be here. You know, this is really very, very encouraging. Uh, we are an organization that, into, that is into expansion, expansionist mode. So we have extended our time beyond, <laughs> beyond how much, uh, you know, it was 2 to 5 o'clock to now 6 o'clock, 6.15. <laughs> okay, you have to leave. Uh, so we have also in our exhibition, you know, taken the corridors <laughs> that are nearby. Our butterfly has flown to other pavilions as well. Okay, so so I think uh, our our coalition is doing well. Our butterfly is really flying high. Uh, what gives me confidence is that uh, something that we begin to think through a few months ago is now beginning to take shape. I'm not saying that we are completely clear on what we'll be doing. And uh, our way of reaching that clarity is somewhat different than that of uh, Germans, our colleagues from Kaiser. You know, <laughs> our way of reaching that is a little take one step forward, take two step backwards. So don't worry about that. There will be a little bit of chaos and a little bit of confusion. This is how India has progressed. And this is how I think societies are going to progress in future. <coughs> societies will progress with a very different paradigm you know it's 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 a very different paradigm that we are going to look at uh, globally in terms of transformation what we see in this uh, seventh uh, elements framework of a butterfly are seven entry areas of change which have been fairly reasonably articulated in the presentations today uh, maybe more clarity will emerge as we move forward. We have also showcased you some specific initiatives which are at different stages of implementation. Okay, and I think uh, as we move forward, we'll have more clarity both in terms of action there but also on initiatives, the actions that we will actually take on the ground. Another interesting uh, you know, aspect of the discussions here today and our participation in World Food India was that this, this new coalition has become more visible to the world outside. You know, it has, uh, you know, the unfortunate thing is that we could not invite many people in this room. Several people who were invited, they must still be lost in finding out where we are, whether we are in Hall 3 or Hall Lectures. 15 or 8, wherever. So they are still lost somewhere. I'll check up and apologize because to them personally. Huh? Because of the word TBD. TBD. <laughs> so, but, but the point is that we have, we have reached certain amount of clarity on where we are going. And let me tell you, many people, you know, my uh, colleague from FSSCI I mentioned about several initiatives. Uh, and I keep telling my colleagues in Food Feature Foundation, all those I have a photograph. You should record that you were presenting. <laughs> Behind every successful man. Why don't you come then join us, please? Hi everyone, I am English Patrana from Country Life. So on, on behalf of the entire Country Life family, Professor, we thank you very much for uh, uh, allowing us to be part of this great opportunity. We really appreciate that. And taking inspiration from Pavan sir yet again, as he said about...